we're going to start off this afternoon with uh, molecular PCR analysis for genetically resistant weeds. Um, and Martin has pre-recorded his um, presentation, so we're going to start with that. And then he is going to graciously listen and be ready to answer questions afterwards. Just a little bit about um, Martin. He is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. He has a PhD from uh, Laval University in molecular biology. We're not even going to say what year because that would give away your age and we know you're only 25. Um, <laughs> he worked for a while with DNA Landmarks, a BASF plant science subsidiary, before joining AFC. Uh, he's been characterizing herbicide resistant weeds in Canada with the aim of elucidating mechanisms uh, allowing weeds to survive herbicide application. So to this end, he's using molecular and genetic tools to study the more complex cases of herbicide resistance. He's been a source of information for me and I'm happy to have him here today joining us. And so we are going to throw this over to the pre-recorded um, recording, I guess, and then we'll come back to us live. So tech. Hello everybody. I'm very happy to be given the opportunity to present the work we've been doing. I would like to thank the organizers. Given the current situation, we have to adapt the way we do presentations and I hope you will be able to learn something today. As always, what's going to be presented today is not all of my work. Several colleagues have or will contribute. We're all from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, except for Kristen Obeid, she's with OMAFRA, and David Meville, he's with MAPAC. Marie Josée and I are located in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, just south shore of Montreal. Eric Page and Rob Nurse are located in Harrow, Ontario. Charles Geddes, Jolene Sutton, Justin Pahara, Jan Lowry are located in Lethbridge, Alberta, and Cesarina Cora is located in Ottawa. So why talk about weeds? Well, because it matters. In 2018, in Canada, producers bought much more herbicides than any other pesticides on the farm. In terms of kilogram of active ingredients, almost three quarters of all pesticides were herbicides. Why? Because weeds are responsible for the largest yield loss potential among pests. It's about half of the risks. Crop losses to weed is also the best controlled. 74% of the potential losses are saved by herbicide use. This efficacy, however, is threatened by herbicide-resistant weeds. Losses due to weeds amount to several hundred million dollars, 528 million every year, and herbicide resistance is threatening even further productions. The appearance of herbicide resistance is due to the repetitive usage of the same herbicide or herbicides belonging to the same group. A lot of data on herbicide-resistant weeds is collected on weedscience.org website by Ian Heap. This graph presents the chronological increase in unique cases of herbicide-resistant weeds. A unique case is a species times site of action. So, if a fleabane becomes resistant to atrazine, a group 5, it is listed, is listed as one unique case. If another population of fleabane because, becomes resistant to ALS inhibitors, group 2, then it is counted as a separate unique case. But if a third population is found with multiple resistance to both group 2 and group 5 herbicides, it does not count, as the, others, uh, the other two have already been recorded. Here are the numbers for Canada. We have a total of 68 unique cases and it is steadily increasing. Here's a slide I really like, uh, mostly because I don't have to change it very often. It shows the chronological order of appearance of the different modes of actions. You can see in there a variety of groups that you are familiar with. Group 1s, for example, to control grasses, broadleaf control with group 2s, and so on. What is noticeable about this graph is that no new modes of action have been introduced since the early 90s. 
I was still in school back then and I'm not so young. Weeds have also evolved resistance to several groups of herbicides. For example, Lolium rigidum, annual ryegrass. It has developed resistance to herbicides belonging to 14 different groups. More common species in Canada, or at least that I know of, are uh, water hemp and wild oat that are resistant to seventh group of herbicides, fleabane, common ragweed, and red root pigweed to five groups. As I said in the beginning, we work as a group. I don't pretend to know what is happening in the prairies. Luckily, some other members of the group know. So Charles Geddes provided me with some slides with data that will be more relevant here. I wanted to mention briefly the extensive work that has been and is still being done in regards to weed surveys and herbicide resistance. The bad news is that the presence of HR weed is increasing. The total area infested is 23.7 million acres. For example, wild oat resistant to group one herbicides is a big problem. It is present in almost 80% of all fields in Manitoba. I guess I do not have to tell you that it is a problem. Uh, I really like the next set of slides because it shows how herbicides options can be drastically reduced because of resistance. Here's a list of product to control waddled according to the Guide to Crop Protection 2019. In red uh, are the herbicides that can no longer be used when there is group 1 resistance. Even more are lost when group 2 resistance is added on top. And when resistance to group 8 is present, only Liberty and glyphosate can be used in season meaning all others are pre-herbicides. Almost all herbicides are gone. What genetic tests needs to be done? Well, it will depend on the chemistry of the herbicide used. Different groups of herbicides will target different functions within this plant cell. Cellular division, group four, Photosynthesis, several group, 5, 6, 7, 11, 12, so on. Fatty acid biosynthesis, group 1, group 8, 15, and 26. And finally, amino acid synthesis, group 2, group 9, and group 10. The target site refers to the protein that is targeted by the herbicide. Ty diagnostic tests will look at mutations in these genes that code for these proteins. Here are the list of the genes. Group 1. The group 1 target is acetyl-CoA carboxylase, ACCase. Group 2 target is acetolactate synthase, ALS. Group 5 and 7 target is PSBA. Group 9 target is EPSPS, glyphosate resistance. Group 14 target is PPO. And group 27 target is AP HPPD. How does resistance evolve? It is a natural phenomenon called selection. Herbicide resistance is present in weed populations as natural variations. When selective pressure is applied by herbicides, resistant plants are favored as a result of consecutive application year after year after year the resistant weed becomes dominant and more importantly competes with the crop for resources and decreases production yield. This is a phenomenon that occurs at an exponential rate. A resistant weed can invade a field completely in just a few years. But are the weeds really resistant? Before making that conclusion, a few questions need to be asked. Was the herbicide uh, used according to the label? Was there a problem during application? Are the plants surviving application distributed in patches? 
Is there a single weed species surviving application? Is there an history of control problem in this field? And what was the same herbicide or herbicides belonging to the same group used repeatedly? Here's what the patch looks like. It's green, and the rest is brown. Another patch, there's more green in between the rows. So the idea is to take action and prevent herbicide resistance to spread. One way to do this is to detect early and have a rapid response. Remove the resistance weed uh, as soon as we see them in the field. For this, we have the opportunity to use genetic tests, which are cutting edge technology. Resistance confirmation is already something that is done. The classical approach takes several months to perform. I've tried to depict each season with a tree. Here's a blooming tree, that is spring, a tree with leaves, that's summer, a tree without leaves, that's fall, a tree with snow, that's winter, and back with a blooming tree in the spring. So first, weeds need to set seed. Then these seeds need to be harvested and conditioned to germinate. They are sown and seedlings will be sprayed with the herbicide. Finally, after two to four weeks, the impact of the herbicide is scored and a conclusion is reached. The time it takes to confirm if a weed is resistant often leads us into the next growing season. The weed had time to spread resistance either through pollen or seeds. A genetic test can be much quicker, under a week if all hands are on deck. Samples are harvested, put in a plastic bag, shipped, and when they are received, the DNA is extracted and the genetic test is performed. The, the, the genetic tests are developed and validated. They are made available to provincial labs for commercial growers to use. Easy enough, right? Not really. There are many weed species and resistance mechanisms can be really different from one to another. Target sites mutations are sim the simplest form. The targeted gene can be overexpressed and this will confer also resistance. Other mechanisms, very complex, are involved in detoxification. Herbicide can be degraded by the plant or stored in a place where they are not active anymore. We can only test for what we know and research is needed for the other cases. An herbicide has a specific site, that's called the target site of action, where it acts to disrupt a particular plant process or function, that's the mode of action. If this target site is somewhat altered by a point mutation, for example, the herbicide is no longer able to bind to the site of action and is unable to exert its phytotoxic effect. This is the most common, common mechanism of herbicide resistance. Here is the case for common ragweed resistant to group 2 herbicides. The TGG codon here, codes for tryptophan, the naturally occurring amino acid. One mutation converts TGG to TTG, coding for leucine. The single base change is enough to prevent the herbicide to bind, but allows normal protein function. Therefore, with this mutation, the plant is able to survive application of group 2 herbicides. Plants have developed other mechanisms to become resistant to herbicides. They are said to be non-target site. Metabolism is a mechanism used by the plant to detoxify foreign compounds such as herbicides. A weed that can degrade an active ingredient quickly can inactivate it before it reaches its site of action in the plant. The genes involved are cytochrome P450, glutationes transferase, Glucase glucose transferase. Some plants are able to restrict the movement of, uh, of the active ingredient within the cell or tissues to prevent adverse effects. In this case, the herbicide can be inactivated by binding with a ligand, a sugar molecule, for example, 
or removed from the metabolically active region of the cell to inert locations, such as the cell wall or the vacuole. ABC transporters and some other transporters are typically involved. Here's an example. It's a cornfield with susceptible on the left and resistant on the right, giant foxtail. Uh, this picture is not from me, but we do have herbicide resistant giant foxtail in Quebec. We have identified a mutation conferring the resistance and devised a genetic test. Here is what it looks like when we run the genetic test. Plants with similar genotypes will cluster together. On the top left, those are homozygous mutant. They have two copies of the mutation because common ragweed is diploid. On the lower right, these are the susceptible plants. They do not have the mutation. In the lower left part, of the, uh, those are the heterozygous plants. They have one copy of each allele, one resistant and one susceptible. Since resistance is dominant, these plants are resistant to the herbicide. We have also studied common ragweed that is resistant to linuron, a group 7 herbicide. In 36% of the populations studied, we have identified a new mutation that confers herbicide resistance. For the rest of the populations, 64% of them, the mechanism of resistance is not so simple and more work is needed to understand why this plant is resistant. This mutation that we have identified is very interesting. It also confers resistance to group 5 herbicides, such as atrazine. It raises the question, can this weed infest both large acre crops and vegetable fields? And what, it, what is its origin? Finally, the last case I want to talk about is group 1 resistant large crabgrass. Here's a picture of a field infestation from 2012. This picture was taken by Kristen Obie. It's a carrot field. As you can see here, there are a few ca carrots. But it's mostly large crabgrass. This case was found in Ontario, near Leamington, where a producer complained about the lack of control in the carrot onion rotation. He had used group 1 herbicides repetitively over the past several years. It was unclear at the time if it was really a resistance because of delayed application due to heavy rain. Here is what it looks like. These plants are treated with the label rate of SELECT. Dead susceptible, thriving resistant biotype. Rumners and his team performed a dose response experiment to confirm resistance. Briefly, Young seedlings are sprayed with different quantities of herbicides and the impact on biomass is used to calculate a resistance factor. With this experiment, it was possible to confirm that the resistant biotype can tolerate 4.7 times more select than the susceptible biotype, 14 times more assured to, more than 64 times Puma Advance, more than 71 times Venture, and more than 119 times post. In my lab, we were able to determine that resistance is due to the overexpression of the gene that is targeted by the herbicide, acetylcoa carboxylase, ACCase. We have seen a 16 to 20 fold increase in expression for the ACCase gene, both when plants are sprayed or sprayed only with water. Here's how it's happening. ACCase is responsible for the synthesis of malonyl-CoA, the precursor of fatty acid. When a group 1 herbicide is present, this function is blocked. Group 1 resistance crabgrass produces a lot of ACCase protein, effectively drowning the herbicide in a large number of proteins. This way, the plant is able to synthesize fatty acids and survive herbicide treatment. The initial case was found in a carrot onion rotation. In 2017, we have seen group 1 resistant large crabgrass in a pumpkin field. 
It was also seen in soybean fields. Here's a brief history of that wheat. It was initially seen in 2011 in a carrot and onion rotation affecting one field and 40 hectares. In 2015, it was again seen in a carrot and onion rotation, two fields from the same farm, again covering 40 hectares. In 2017, we tested four fields, three tested positives. It was three fields from three different farms covering only five hectares. All cases that have been found were 100 kilometers apart. Let's switch gear now uh, a little bit. I want to talk about the spread of resistant weeds through crop weed hybrids. More specifically, I will talk about Brassica species. Broccoli, cauliflower, canola, and bird's rape are very closely related. Here's the triangle of you that shows this relationship. Canola is basically an hybrid between Brassica leracea and Brassica rapa. Brassica rapa has a genome AA and Brassica oleracea has a CC genome. Therefore, canola has the, being the hybrid, has the AACC genome. An hybrid between canola and bird's rape is also possible, but it's not stable. In 2001 and 2015, glyphosate resistance bird's rape was found in Quebec, on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River near Quebec City. As you may know, bird's rape and canola are very difficult to tell apart. The MAP Act has produced a document to help identification. We have studied the 2015 cases and shown that the trans gene in commercial canola could be found in bird's rape. That's a band here at 106 base pair. We have also shown that this is indeed bird's rape since the C genome is absent. There is no band here. It is not canola. These genetic tests were also used to characterize two populations found in 2017. All individuals were positive for the commercial transgene. These genetic tests were also used to characterize two populations found in 2017. All individuals were positive for the commercial transgene, but were not canola. Here we have a table showing the list of resistant plants that we've worked with, identified a resistance causing mutation and develop a genetic test. We have large crabgrass that is resistant to group 1 herbicides, giant foxtail, eastern black nightshade, common ragweed, pigweeds, water hemp, common chickweed, water hemp again that is resistant to group 2 herbicides, lamb's quarters, water hemp, common ragweed that is resistant to group 5 and 7 herbicides, uh, flea bane, water hemp, water hemp, there are two mutations actually, bird's rape that are resistant to group 9 herbicide, water hemp that is resistant to PPO inhibitors. Uh, we have a test to differentiate Brassica species and also we're able to uh, differentiate uh, pigweeds. This is the overall picture of the genetic test performed in 2017 in Ontario and Quebec. It turned out that 42% that the of the cases that we analyzed uh, were positive for herbicide resistance. Um, in Ontario, you have large crabgrass, like mentioned before, eastern black nightshade, common ragweed, uh, lamb's quarters, again, crabgrass. We didn't have uh, m many uh, pigweed tests at that time, so it's mostly those uh, species. The take home message 2017 was the first year where the genetic tests were used. Here's a table that shows the list of resistant plants that we have worked with uh, in 2020. Th those are the 2020 results. Uh, you have uh, lamb's quarters, green pigweeds, a lot of pigweeds now um, because we've de developed these tests, common ragweed, several groups of herbicides that were tested, five. The, the major ones are group one, group two, group five, group seven, and some group nine. Um, 51 fields were analyzed in 2020 in Ontario, 88% uh, positive rate for resistance. 
Here are the results for Quebec in 2020. The table is large and the characters are very small, but uh, there's a lot of common ragweed and a lot of pigweeds. In total, 90, pop 90 populations were analyzed and 72% proved to be resistant to at least one group of herbicides. The genetic tests have the big advantage of providing answers during the growing season, so you can take action. But they have limits, false negatives being the most important one. Because of that, classical resistance testing is very much important. Another limit of genetic testing is that multiple mutations can confer resistance, and they have all to be tested. There are also cases of multiple resistance, where again, multiple tests must be performed. Finally, not everybody can do this in their, in their basement, and we need to build the infrastructure to support genetic testing. Again, I don't pretend to know enough to tell you how to manage your field, of course. I've listed here a, list, a series of actions you can take to manage herbicide resistant weeds once they have appeared. Uh, for example, do a herbicide group rotation, a crop rotation that allows for different herbicides. Certain crops will be more competitive. Uh, the use of herbicide resistant crops like Ronda Predi Maize, for example. The use of tank mixes, precision spraying, tilling, hoeing, hand weeding. The use of mulches, cover crops, and green manure. Green manure. Our plans are to create something similar to what has been done in Quebec and Ontario to offer rapid genetic tests in the prairies. Charles Geddes and Jolene Sutton from AAC Leadbridge will lead this project. The current proposal is designed to take advantage of the methods that are already available when appropriate. For example, the markers for amaranth, chickweed, green foxtail, land squatters, kochia. We will also work to develop new markers for weeds that are more specific to your growing region. There is also the elephant in the room, wild oat, that is particularly troublesome. We will look into it, but the fact that it is an exaploid uh, with a very large genome complicates the work. I want also to introduce another project that we're proposing in this year's financing round, gene silencing more particularly using RNA interference. There are three types, either host-induced gene silencing, which is typically obtained with transgenic plants, spray-induced gene silencing, where, as the name implies, you could spray plants to achieve herbicide activity, and finally, virus-induced gene silencing. I'll talk a little bit more about spray-induced gene silencing. The idea is to create a spray that can specifically kill the weed but not the crop. Or to create a spray that can increase susceptibility of the weed to an herbicide. The application of the herbicide will then kill the weed even though it was resistance in the first place. This goal would be feasible using small molecules called double-strand RNA or DSRNA. DSRNA would penetrate the cell. What happens next depends on the target. If the targets are insects, they would eat the DSRNA. This DSRNA would inactivate genes through RNA interference and the insects would get sick and eventually die. Similarly for fungal pathogens, the DSRNA would be transferred to the pathogen during the infection and after RNA interference gene silencing, the pathogen, pathogen would no longer be able to attack the plant. For weeds, gene silencing would either kill the plant or render it more susceptible to the herbicide. Here is an example of this technology being used to control Fusarium gaminarium infections on barley leaves. That's uh, Fusarium head blight. You can clearly see the lesions are less important on the leaves treated with double strand RNA. At the control at the bottom is infected. Similarly, the Colorado potato, potato beetle is arrested in its development 
when it treated with actin double strand iron. It is not the case when it's treated with either water or GFP DSRNA, which is a coding uh, for a non essential gene. Biodirect, which was Monsanto and now is Bayer, has worked a little bit with this technology. They used it to show that it can control glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth and water hemp. In the example, the double strand RNA molecule has reverted the plant back to being susceptible to glyphosate, which effectively killed the plants upon application. So, we are proposing to target weeds specific to three regions of Canada in our project. We target herbicide resistant weeds, kochia, because it's a big issue in the prairies, common ragweed and amaranth are more frequent in Quebec and Ontario, but I understand amaranth control might be interesting here too. We are planning to target two genes, acetolactate synthase, ALS, the gene that is targeted by group two herbicides, EPSPS, the gene that is targeted by glyphosate. We hope to be able to kill, kill the weeds, but not the crop, or at least render them more susceptible to the herbicide, so you can spray the herbicide and it would die again. RNA interference is highly specific to the sequence, and therefore we should be able to target the weed and leave the crop untouched. There are certain challenges to using RNA interference. The design of the DSRNA must be just right. RNA has a tendency to be very fragile, so we need to make sure it is stable over time. To be effective, the DSRNA needs to penetrate the plant cell, and this is the biggest problem we see right now. We will test different formulations, nanomaterials, cell penetrating peptides, there's also the cost issue. The DSRNA is very expensive to produce. Maybe large-scale large, large scale production will drive costs down in the future. All of the examples I have shown so far were made in the lab, in the growth chamber and greenhouses. How will it scale up at the field level, even if we only uh, treat patches? Is it safe to use for the other, other plants for the farmer, for the animals, for the insects. And finally, there are regulatory issues, but I think we, we are far from these discussions at this time. With that, I will stop. I want to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions uh, live. Uh, thank you and stay safe. One of the questions is uh, dealing with the elephant in the room and wild oat, the group one resistance testing. We know that there's some handheld devices for black grass resistance testing. Does any of that transfer over or is that wild oat being a haploid starting to mess with uh, how we develop those tests? Um, well, the, I, I think the, the device for uh, black grass is, is, you know, it's quantifying one protein in particular. Um, in the case of black grass, uh, there's a unknown mechanism, a non-target site mechanism that has not been characterized yet. And, and there are several mutations that are known to confer resistance. Um, so at this point, I, I don't, it's not easy develop, to develop uh, such an apparatus because it's, it's not the same mechanism of resistance so far. Or, or yeah, there's this several mechanisms. So if you use a device, you might be able to check for one, but not for all. Um, so then one of the other questions that came up is with the genetic testing, are you able to target, or are you able to test for both target site and non-target site resistance, or does it only work for certain types of resistance mechanisms? Um, we would be able to test for both, um, but finding the non-target site resistance mechanism is much more difficult. So very few have been identified so far. Okay. And so the whole RNA scenario, we've been imagining that magic potion for a day or two at least, quite a few days actually. Um, 
you mentioned some obstacles. How soon do you see that actually happening? Um, I don't know. I can't answer that. Right <laughs> <laughs> I'd like for it to be done already uh, because because um, I'm more familiar for, for with, with the growers here uh, growing carrots and onions where there's common ragweed and, and there's no more herbicides for them. So they have to hand weed everything. Uh, and, and I guess, yeah, my, my dream would be to be able to do that with wild oat, um, but it's maybe too big a, a chunk to, to start with. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be in the short term, unfortunately. There's a lot of work to be done. Okay, so the primary um, obstacle, is it the fragility of the RNA? Like what's, what's holding it back? I think it's 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 the package, you know. The, the I think we're able to prolong prolong a little bit better now the, the longevity of the dsRNA, uh, but the cuticle to get through the cuticle and into the plant cell is is quite a, a challenge, and also you know it's very costly to produce dsRNA in the formulations so far. Maybe um, large scale production will mm -hmm. decrease the cost, but uh, uh, since we don't know exactly how to do it now, um, it's seen as a big challenge. Sure. So I noticed um, that there's rapid tests for lots of weeds. How close are you to this wild oat resistance testing being mm -hmm. rapid test? Not to belabor the point, but I think that that's something people are, might be interested in. I might yeah. be one of them. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, um, we are working on it. Um, I can't pro promise anything, of course, uh, but there's also one part uh, that is a non-target site that we don't have a test for. Uh, um, Ubeck, he has published some papers where he's characterized the mutations. Uh, we're trying to, to replicate his results and also maybe improve the, the technology to, to make it more amenable, amenable to high throughput genotyping. Um, but as I said, it's, it's hard to work with, with uh, wild oat. Um, so you touched on it a bit that uh, life, like actually growing plants out and having that resistance testing opportunity is still important that they kind of maybe go hand in hand or you need both. Um, it, it, was that was that sort of what I heard, or are you hoping that at some point in time these rapid tests will eliminate growing plants? Yeah, uh, as I said, false false negatives is a big risk. So we tend to to confirm rapidly what is confirmable, the, the positive cases. So you get an answer fast for that, and um, for the the negative ones, well, we do the traditional test because it could be something else. Um, I think they're, they're here to stay because the, the plants are very imaginative in, or they're very capable of developing new resistance mechanisms uh, and, and you would not want to, to call a negative that is positive. So I think that that's all the questions that were sent in. I'm just going to mention that um, if you're looking for CCA credits that scan the code or write down the code and submit it. Um, and I'm just gonna give a, a brief minute or two here to see if we get any more questions that come up or if I did manage to answer all of, all of the questions that were there. So this will be a warning for our next group of presenters that uh, in a minute we'll get started with your uh, session as well. Um, I appreciate your talk, Martin. Um, I appreciate the fashion cues that you've uh, provided me as well. Um, that was deeply appreciated. I don't see any more uh, questions for you. Um, contact information, if we, if we come up with something, do you want to share any of your contact information or are you hiding? Do you have a Twitter handle that we should be following? I'm not very active on Twitter, uh, oh, but sure. <laughs> but um, you can contact me via email, uh, Martin, M -A -R -T -I -N, dot L -A -F -A -L -A -F -O -R E S T L-A-F-O-R-E-S-T, uh, at, at uh, Canada.ca. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation and your time. I look forward to your PCR uh, analysis for herbicide resistance and wild oat. No pressure, but... 
you know, <laughs> next week's not too soon. Thank you for inviting me, Danny. And okay. Thank you for the organizers.